I run an economic consultancy called Walbrook Economics, and we pride ourselves in writing independent research. So this was a, a slight deviation uh, from the norm, but what I tried to do was to look at official government data, be it the, the Scottish government's JERS study, or the Office of National Statistics, or other official sources, to look dispassionately at the case uh, for Scottish independence or not. And I have to say uh, that it's my considered opinion that only under the very most optimistic oil price assumptions, split of national debt, split of oil reserves, could Scottish independence work. Those are very unlikely scenarios indeed, in my view. What we've tried to do in this document, and it, it covers a lot of ground, is look at about 10 or 12 areas of the economy. But the big ones, as you're well aware, are currency, they're how oil is split, what happens to the oil sector, the banking sector, critical to the Scottish economy, public spending and taxation. I've laid out in this document why maintaining sterling is the only credible option. Yes, there are other options like joining uh, the euro. It makes little sense when 70% of Scotland's trade is to the rest of the United Kingdom. And I think we, uh, you've seen the problems of, uh, of peripheral Europe. And Scotland can have really no influence on European policy. It's 1% of the population of the European Union. So it's delusional to believe that Scotland can exert the amount of influence on Europe that it exerts on the United Kingdom. Forming one's own currency is fraught with difficulty as well, for, for the very uh, clear reason that you've got to be fiscally highly responsible or you'll see your currency decline. And in any case, doing that will mean currency fluctuations with your closest partner, the rest of the UK, where trade uh, it still dominates. The trouble with borrowing sterling, as Alex Salmond seems to think he can do, is it works until it doesn't. Unless you have the lender of last resort of the Bank of England's balance sheet, any shocks to the system will be magnified in Scotland. What is more is that Scotland, although it has many good assets, is a highly cyclical economy. And the reason it's cyclical is dependent on three big sectors. Over 50% of the economy is the state, and that is dependent on tax receipts ultimately. But oil, 2% of Her Majesty's government's tax receipts are oil, for Scotland, over the last 20 years, it's averaged 10 or 11 percent, sometimes been as high as 20. There's an enormous cyclicality, and Alex Salmon cannot predict the price of oil any more than I can. And the bank sector, great asset. The trouble is that 12 times, banking assets are 12 times GDP. Iceland's were just over 8, Ireland's were just over 6 during, at the credit crunch. So I put it to you, if Scotland does separate from the United Kingdom, the Royal Bank of Scotland and HBOS will have a very unpalatable choice of either relocating to London or shrinking their balance sheets precipitously. To run uh, assets of 12 times GDP is frankly a casino, and if Scotland had been independent, in my judgment, uh, in 2008, the country would have gone bankrupt. It would have been a Darien scheme all over again. It is cr of critical importance to Scotland that it maintains the lender of last resort from the Bank of England, and I don't think that's on offer. There are many uh, other reasons to why I think Scotland's power is magnified within, uh, within uh, the UK. Uh, and if we look at the note, we look at public spending, it's, it's about 12% higher in Scotland uh, than it is in the rest of the country. Scotland's an averagely rich part of the UK, no more, no less. So the question is, how is that gap going to be bridged. Looking at the JER study, which is uh, not a football team, but is uh, Scot Scottish Government's own um, uh, analysis, Scotland raised £48 billion in tax last year, and they spent £65 billion. £17 billion gap. That is an enormous gap. It's 13% of, of GDP. That is one of the largest fiscal deficits of any country in Europe, and is simply not sustainable. So in the short term, you can probably borrow a little bit, or where there's a price for that, but in the long term, I'm absolutely convinced, given the drivers of the Scottish economy and the risk to the banking sector, which probably will shrink, uh, that Scotland will have some very unpalatable choices. But I wouldn't like to be Alex Salmond, if he's still around in five or six years' time, explaining to the Scottish Parliament that taxes are rising and the NHS is being cut, education is being cut, and all these nice promises that he's made really have turned to dust. I know this is a big document. If you get the chance, do read um, the, the summary. There's a lot on why Scotland actually has more sovereignty by being part of the United Kingdom, which I think is an interesting and positive 
angle that we should, should make. Uh, but having looked at this from a dispassionate, uh, independent perspective, I was very happy to write it and put my name to, to this. Uh, and I, I really believe that if Scotland does decide to separate, it's in for a very rocky uh, and, and difficult period. The headline figures that, that you produce of the, the £2,500 per head gap are based on a, allocating to Scotland a, a per capita share of the oil revenues. Now, yeah. now most analysis that we see is done on a geographic share, yeah. because the belief is that uh, where Scotland would become independent, that is the split that would actually occur. Well, was there any particular reason that you, you chose the, the per capita share? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the underlying assumptions that we made throughout. Um, I assumed that Scotland would take on its, per, its population share of national debt. Uh, I uh, assumed uh, that the oil price would stay roughly where it is, and that production would stay roughly where it is, which may, as we've seen actually, I think the, your own party uh, spotted the hole in the, uh, in the finances. Uh, uh, Gavin's good work, yes. So that's yes. well done, because I mean, that, that, that's a three billion delta, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, I didn't actually include that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I made two assumptions. I, I, uh, I, in this book, I look at a population share, and a, a per capita, uh, and, a, and, a, and a geographic share, okay? So the bigger number is population, the smaller number is geographic, okay? So we've looked at both scenarios. What I would say is Alex Salmon seems to think that, that Scotland will get sterling, he seems to think that we'll take on no debt, he seems to think he's get, going to get into the European Union on the same terms that Britain has, and he seems to think he's going to get all the oil. That just is not the way negotiation works. And if we're honest, you know, his negotiating position is really quite weak. 70% of all Scottish trade goes to the rest of the United Kingdom. Only 4% of the rest of the United Kingdom's trade goes to Scotland. So you've got to be very careful. And, you know, he's made comments, I think, by saying to the European Union, we won't allow you fishing rights. He's, he's, he's going to get a rude shock when he starts negotiating with these guys. A very, very rude shock. So I would say that his assumptions are delusional. Yes, perhaps from a negotiating stance, I can understand <coughs> why he's doing that. But let's, let's just assume the best case scenario. And let's assume that Orkney and Shetland want to remain part of the United Kingdom, which if, if Scotland has the right to leave, why not Orkney and Shetland? But that's the debate for another day. But let's assume he gets what he wants. The reality is, four billion barrels in 10 years has gone to one and a half. It costs $28 to get the oil out of the North Sea. It costs three in Saudi. He can't control the oil price. Uh, we've got a long-term fade, in, uh, and we could debate how quick that, that fade in revenues are. There's no sovereign wealth fund, and you might say that's our fault, but there's no good crying over spilt milk. So this is not Norway, where there are several hundred billion pounds of sovereign wealth. He's going to inherit a situation, if he gets the oil, he'll take on the debt, almost certainly. Where Scotland has a high level of debt, it's got a highly volatile revenue stream, and Scotland is less volatile than the UK because it's more diversified. Oil moves from anywhere between 10 and 20% to about 2%. So how you manage, if you were First Minister, I was First Minister, I don't know how I'd manage that. Very difficult. Uh, a number of very senior economists um, took the view that the best deal for an independent Scotland was to do a, 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 an oil for debt swap. So, so they would agree to take on a lower share of UK debt in exchange for giving up a, a, a chunk of the oil fields, which I thought was quite interesting. Well, listen, if Scotland votes yes, we're then going to be in a period of negotiation. And the negotiation will be with the British government and the European Union. Uh, the, negotiate, the negotiation will cover every aspect of Scottish life, from how pensions are split, savings, what currency, and it will be in a non-smoke-filled room, as you lot have banned uh, smoking in, in buildings, which uh, I don't smoke myself, but uh, 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 there will be a grubby series of negotiations. But it is not credible to believe that Scotland doesn't get any debt and it gets the best uh, uh, and remember, if Scotland goes too far and overplays its hand, there will be reprisals because its trade is with the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, so I think that they need to be quite careful not to overplay what's actually a weak, a weak hand. It's exactly the same argument with the European Union and Britain as it is with Britain and, uh, and, and Scotland. The UK's position, the UK, whether we like it or not, has to play within the, the, the rules of engagement of Europe and has an 8% vote. Uh, Scotland's had a disproportion to say, and I'm glad to, to see that. I mean, in all areas of life, be it cultural, uh, uh, be it sporting, uh, be it economic, the number of, of Scots that play at the highest level in the UK is well above 8%.
And I want to make this point, actually, it's deviating slightly on the subject of, of culture. Kirsty Walk might be the last significant Scot you see on the BBC. And I'm being serious, you don't see many Southern Irish uh, uh, voices. Over time, the number of Scots playing a significant part in the life of the United Kingdom will decline. And actually, that's a magnification of reduced Scottish power. Yes, you might have 100%, but well, you won't have, because actually Europe will still make many of the laws. Uh, but you might, within that context, have slightly greater power, but it will be greatly diminished power. So the patriotic thing is to vote no, because that actually increases Scottish power in a British context and a global context. What's your take on the governor's remarks yesterday? It appears he may have thrown a lifeline. To... Well, I, I actually had the privilege, if that's the right word, of hearing a question time at the Scottish Parliament five minutes ago. And you have to hand it to Alex Salmond. He can turn a bad hand into something that appears seductively attractive. But what did Mark Carney actually say? He actually said, we've got a contingency plan. Of course he should have a contingency plan. Uh, it would be irresponsible of him not to have a contingency plan. What he didn't say was well, Scotland could have sterling. What he didn't say is that we would be lender of the last resort. It, frankly, if Scotland votes yes, there will be a flow of capital out of the Bank of Scotland, out of the Royal Bank of Scotland, to Lloyds, to NatWest, to whoever, UBS. And what he is saying is in that scenario, he would have a fiduciary duty to try and prop that up in the short term. Uh, and that, uh, to, to, to stop chaos. Now, uh, UBS uh, wrote quite an interesting note on this, and they looked at what happened in Canada. And when it was very close in Canada, when Quebec were close to splitting away, there was 20% of capital left Quebec. And a lot of that went to Toronto. And to this day, Toronto has stolen Quebec's lunch. So what Alex Salmon is doing is very dangerous. And it's also dangerous because Standard Life, and I, and I don't want to pick on them, and I don't want to put words into their mind, mouth, but most of the Scottish fund management companies and financial services companies, 90% of their customers are south of the border. And their customers will be quite nervous of investing in a company, and in a country rather, which may have a different currency, may not have lender of last resort, and they will be either forced to move headquarters <coughs> or they'll lose business. So I think it's a very dangerous scenario. And I don't think Mark Carney has sold the pass actually. It may have been better he said nothing, that's a different debate. But actually, if you see what he said, all he said is we've got a plan B, and he said it'd be unwise to talk about it. Thank you. Apologies for... Uh, Not at all. Thank um, you. you know, the, the, the debate really kicked off a couple of years ago when the ICAST pensions paper came out. Pensions has been one of the, the critical issues of the campaign. Um, mortgages, I think, could have been, might still become, but mortgages hasn't really barked as loudly as I think it probably could or should. I'm just interested in your own views on what do you think would happen uh, to mortgages in Scotland were we to uh, get a yes vote and separate well, um, we've had a, a significant financial crisis, as, as you'll be aware. Um, interest rates are half a percent at the short end, and uh, the long 10-year money is about 2.8, 2.7, something along those lines. So uh, the, the mortgage spread, uh, you can probably borrow for three, three and a half, something along those lines, uh, uh, quite typically. The UK has, despite this crisis, performed pretty well relative to, to Europe and most other parts of the world, has been able to hold very low interest rates across the curve. Uh, most analysts, myself included, uh, would be of the view that Scotland would pay an interest rate premium if it acted fiscally responsibly, irrespons sorry, fiscally responsibly, of about half to 1%. Uh, now that doesn't sound much, but on a £100,000 mortgage, that's £500 a year, to £1,000 a year. But it's, it's actually a little more interesting than that, because if the mortgage goes up £500 to £1,000, the value of the property probably gets capped out as well a little bit. Now, if Scotland acted irresponsibly, uh, and it wouldn't happen overnight, you know, we were talking about, uh, and the fiscal deficit became large, you, you saw what happened to Greece in the extreme, you saw what happened to Iceland, to Ireland, where the curve blew up. So, I, you know, I don't want to be polemic about it, and I think it would be wrong to, to, to make that analogy in the short term. But it, it, in, under the scenario that Scotland is independent, under the scenario it gets all the oil, but it takes on the debt, Scotland will be inheriting a fiscal deficit of about 9% of GDP. Uh, that is one of the worst in the European Union. It's not the worst, but it's in the bottom quartile, let's put it that way. And 
I, I am concerned that if you look at the drivers of public spending, they're quite similar to England and the rest of the UK actually. It's dominated by health, education and, and, and welfare. It's about 65-70% of the budget. Um, quite difficult areas to cut for demographic reasons and all, all, all the rest of it. So spending is probably on a trajectory that does that. You've got tax receipts doing that because oil's up there, it's down there, it's all over the place. And maybe some of the banks have gone or reduced, let's put it that way. So I think you could have a fiscal crisis quite shortly. That not only means tax rises or spending cuts, but it means higher interest rates. And, and, it, it, and Scotland is not the Bank of England. The Bank of England's got 300 years of history. I'm not a great fan of quantitative easing as a policy, and I've criticised it, actually, professionally. But they were able to do it. It's not credible to believe that markets would trust an independent Scotland to print money. They just wouldn't. So I, I genuinely think this, this, an independent Scotland only works if you think the price of oil is going to be very high, uh, that they're going to basically get away with taking on very much debt, uh, and uh, they get virtually all the oil, and, uh, and on that basis it just about works. I still think it's unhealthy because I think culturally Scotland will become very insular and inward looking uh, and it will lose, you know, we haven't talked about defence or diplomacy and all these sort of areas, so I still wouldn't favour it under that scenario. But if there's a normal distribution of probability, you're looking at, you know, two standard deviations at that side for, for it being, being a happy scenario, in, in, my, in my judgment. It's also interesting, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, who were on the radio today, as well, produced a paper which uh, they think they're sitting on the fence, which is, is fair enough. But under most of their scenarios, they still suggested that Scotland would be quite a bit worse off and it would still be a net cost. Uh, not as much as I think. Uh, and, you know, I, I privately accept that the numbers we've come out with are open to a standard deviation. That's my central case. And I'm happy to stand by those numbers. But, you know, there is a deviation around that, that, that possibility. But very, very few analysts believe that the economic case for um, independent separation, call it what you will, is, is, is strong. I think Chandler yeah, no. said that a lot of companies uh, may well stay when he reduces corporation tax to 10 or 12 percent. Do you think there's merit in that? Do you think that. Uh, well, you know, let, let's be honest. Um, it, 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 uh, if he's allowed to do it, and it, that, well, it he doesn't could do it, couldn't he? It, it depends if he wants to join the EU, and not sure that the EU will, uh, would allow. Uh, but let's assume he is allowed to do it. That would be a sensible policy, in my judgment. Uh, uh, and uh, that's something the Conservative, under that scenario, I, would, I hope the Conservative Party would argue for something uh, uh, similar. But uh, there's more to just corporation tax. Corporation tax in England, is, the rest of the UK, is now quite low. So the gap isn't as big as it was, and the rest of the UK would respond to that. You know, there's no question about that. But the other aspect is top rate tax, and there's an egalitarian streak in Scottish society, and I have no idea what the top rate tax will end up being, but I'll bet you it's at least 50p in the pound, mm -hmm. uh, at least initially. And, you know, executives of companies will have to make a judgment uh, in, the, in the rounds, and I think uh, they will also consider the stability of the economy, and there's no question that the Scottish economy is highly volatile because of oil, which you can't predict, because of banks, which inherently are volatile, as we saw uh, very recently, and a public sector, which on the face of it is not volatile, but ultimately it is, because it's dependent on taxation. So I'm not so sure so many companies will re relocate. You're just gonna, sorry, yeah. uh, just one of Stefan's favorite mantras is that Scotland is a very wealthy country, wealthier than Japan, France, the USA, the list varies considerably, based on GDP. How would that be affected by independence? Could you continue to claim that at any time? Well, uh, Scotland is a wealthy country, I think, because it's, it, it's part of a larger entity. Um, one of the charts, and I think no one else has done this in this, this note, is if you take out the 50.5% of the economy, which is the state sector, uh, and you look at the GVA of each region of the UK, Scotland's private sector is only averagely large in a, in a UK context, and that includes oil, by the way, and it includes the, the banking sector. So, you know, uh, there's a bit of double counting in this. Um, and he's also assuming very favourable oil scenarios. Now, Scotland, the UK is a rich country. It's one of the richest countries in, in, in the world. The question is, where does Scotland's wealth settle on a five or ten year view? It's not on a one or two year view, I suggest, on a five or ten year view. And I think it, it, it will rebase downwards because I think there will be hemorrhaging in the financial services industry. I think oil will do this and that, but on a long term fade. The other sectors like whisky, engineering, Tourism are great industries, but they're simply not big enough in the context of the economy to, to move the dial enough. 
And I think Scotland's got a demographic issue in the sense that uh, healthcare gets more expensive every year, uh, blah, 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 uh, uh, and aspirations are, are, are quite high. But I think in time, and there's a limit to how far you can put tax up, because if Scotland puts up tax too far, people will move to England. Uh, you know, it's, this is a funny sort of independence. It's a semi-independence uh, at, at best. So uh, I think that Scotland's wealth would settle 10, 20% below where it is at the moment. Ironically, I think the rest of the UK benefits from Scotland, and I think the rest uh, Scotland benefits from the rest of the UK. I think it's a symbiotic relationship. The rest of the UK benefits because it magnifies its global power and influence. Uh, I don't think it makes much economic difference, actually. I think it's sort of earnings neutral. Uh, Scotland benefits because it also magnifies its power and influence, but it, it reduces the cyclicality of the Scottish economy uh, and actually uh, allows the social welfare society that the Scots seem to, to want, and I don't think they could, they could have that uh, if they were separated. Did you have a question? Yeah, just follow, I mean, following up on the, on the corporation tax point, let's assume for the sake of argument uh, we became independent, and the, the stated policy of the, of the Scottish government is that corporation tax would be three pence in the pound lower than the rest of the UK. So let's imagine they did that. Yeah. How, how quickly do you think, or how soon would it be before MPs in the north of England and probably all over the rest of the UK suddenly decided they had to reduce it to exactly the same or lower, um, uh, which completely kills the policy. But the second question is, let's assume just for the sake of argument there was a currency union. Okay, All of a sudden uh, it turned out to be bluff and bluster, which it clearly isn't, but Let's just imagine it did. Uh, they agreed some kind of currency union. In, in terms of the sort of level of control uh, that the UK Parliament would want over the Scottish budget and perhaps the Bank of England as well, as well, what what kind of control do you think we might be? I know it's a hypothetical, but the Scottish government seemed to think it would only be overall borrowing limits, and they would have no interest whatsoever in other fiscal policies that we bring forward. And um, most analysts I speak to think it would be to a much deeper level than that, and they take a huge interest in actual uh, individual fiscal policies. Well, you've got two good questions there. The first one about uh, corporation tax. Uh, Ireland uh, had a corporation tax of at least 10% less than Scotland, so I think if it's a 3% difference, I don't, that's not enough. Yeah. You know, it just isn't enough to, to move people, for people to move their headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have to be more, and I actually think if it was more, England or the rest of the UK would respond to that. And, it would, and, they, and both sides would eventually realise this was kind of productive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, do, I don't think uh, the major British political parties are bluffing, and the no, reason no. I don't think they're bluffing is this, that if you... I think your leader actually put it quite nicely in question time today. She says something along the lines, uh, if you get divorced, you don't get to keep the, the joint account. Uh, and, you know, if, you're going to, if you want to be independent, that's fun. But, you know, you can't just pick and choose the little bits and pieces you, you want from, from that. So uh, look at it from Miliband's or David Cameron's perspective. How does he sell that to the rest of the UK's population that actually we're still going to bankroll uh, uh, as lender of last resort? And that's what it's really about. Um, uh, the Scottish banking system. It's just not going to happen. But, but to your point, let's, let's assume a grubby deal uh, was uh, agreed. There would have to be uh, fiscal controls um, and they would have to be rigorously uh, enforced as, uh, as a price. Now we've seen in the European Union, the Euro, what happens if you don't abide by those fiscal rules. Uh, the Troika turn up and you cut public spending uh, and uh, it's really pretty grubby. I mean, Ireland has seen teacher salaries cut precipitously. It has seen a 40% fall in house prices, emigration from Ireland, uh, and uh, it's been really pretty unpleasant, actually. So I, I don't know, I wouldn't want to be specific as to what controls the Bank of England would put on, but I think they, that Scotland would have to closely mirror uh, uh, the rest of the UK's fiscal policy which would be a, a policy of deficit reduction, uh, both in terms of the annual deficit and the total level of debt. Uh, and I, I think there would be uh, a, a careful monitoring of uh, short and medium term plans. So uh, I think that Scotland would, would find inheriting, assuming it takes on the national debt, that I think is, most people would say, if they're gonna get the oil, is, is, a, is a likely scenario. And it's possible there could be a debt for oil swap, but I, you'd assume that would be fiscally neutral. You know, if, if the deal was struck fairly, uh, if that was the the, the case, you you would um, 
Scotland will have to address quite quickly uh, this 17 billion hole, uh, or it's a 13 billion hole in the best oil scenario. You know, and that's a, that's a big hole. You mentioned the migration, obviously, if yeah. tax went up to 50 billion pound, maybe kind of migration from Scotland to England. Do you think, conversely, for devil's advocate, if we retain the same kind of social policies in terms of free higher education, palliative care for the elderly, bus passes, there could be converse migration from the rest of the UK to Scotland because if you're a middle class family in England and you've got university tuition perhaps going up to £16,000 a year, you might have your children priced out of education and perhaps you might decide Well, that. Scotland has uh, decided that, uh, uh, that uh, Scots can have free higher education but if you're coming up from England uh, you have to pay for it. That's fair enough, they can decide that if they wish. However, uh, they agreed to do that because we're part of a, a unitary state called the United Kingdom. If Scotland wants to join the European Union, we haven't talked about that, they will not be allowed to do that. Because English citizens or Welsh citizens will be treated exactly the same way as Bulgarians or Poles or French or Germans. And I will tell you what will happen. There will be cartloads of buses coming up from London uh, uh, to study at Edinburgh University or Abertay or whatever fine institution uh, we can happen to think of. Uh, and um, they'll have to abandon the policy because it will be simply too expensive and they'll have to copy the policy in England. Now, I will say that policy has irked people in England a lot uh, 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 and with some justification. Uh, and this is a serious point. Uh, you know, Scotland would have gone bankrupt, no question about it, in 2008 if it had been a, an independent country. 12 times GDP, banking liabilities, not sustainable. Worse than Ireland, worse than um, uh, Iceland. And, you know, there's got to be a bit of give, give and take here. There's tremendous goodwill in the south of the country towards Scotland. But if Scotland continue to consistently overplay their hands, which is quite weak, there will be a backlash. And it will not be nice. And it will not benefit Scotland and it won't benefit England. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is a very divisive debate. I think it's a sad debate. Uh, I'm pretty confident we can win it. I hope we can win it with a sufficient majority that it kicks it into the, the grass for at least a generation. But, you know, the point you raise is a good one. This will cause a lot of division because, you know, from what's a relatively harmonious situation of reasonably goodwill on both sides, a bit of banter um, could turn quite nasty, actually. Uh, and... Uh, if you're right that there was a reverse migration, and I think that really happened if there was low taxes, and I don't think that's going to happen, uh, um, uh, the, the policy has become unaffordable quite quickly. Yeah. So, just to point yeah. your, your back yeah. on there, just for another question, you, you made the comment as of the UK government 12 times uh, GDP for, yeah. for the banking sector, or at least at the, yeah. at the time of the crash. Um, the Scottish government reports to that, as, as you will look at, as they said, well, it's not, it wasn't 12 times because. X percentage were located in the city of London and elsewhere, and had we been independent uh, when the banks crashed, we would have only been responsible for a much smaller portion, and uh, the Bank of England would have had to uh, step in to help the, the assets in London. But we have heard that argument from them. I think it would be helpful just to get a technical, I mean, I don't buy the argument, but it would be useful to get your technical well, take on, on why that argument is, is bunkum. Yeah, uh, I, there's a number of points. One is, I think, uh, it's on record that Alex Salmond was egging uh, Fred Goodwin on in terms of okay, making yeah. acquisitions and, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that the Royal Bank, in particular the Royal Bank of Scotland, was headquartered in Edinburgh. Its M&A policy was derived from Edinburgh. It was a pretty well Scottish board. It's a, it was a Scottish company. Um, it's a little bit more of a new point on Bank of Scotland because they've merged with HBOS. Uh, um, it was actually the Bank of Scotland's lending book that was the real problem, actually, not the HBOS bit, which is a bit more secure. Uh, but, you know, Iceland uh, had to stand behind, it was unable to stand behind its own banks. It, if it was a Scottish domicile company, he'd have had to stand behind it, uh, and he couldn't have. And actually, I suspect what would have happened is he'd have had to do a grubby deal with the Bank of England uh, um, in, in the end. But, you know, people say, well, it's happened. It's happened only the last time was 148 years ago, and that's true. But we still are, are living in an incredibly uncertain world. You can see what's going on in the, in the Middle East. Uh, you can see the, the growth of, of China, Russia's quite difficult 
relationship, let's put it that way. America printing a lot of money, the British government printing a lot of money, the Eurozone uh, you, you know, in, in trouble. I, I, I've never argued actually the Eurozone was going to break up, I still don't think it will. But uh, I, it, it's, it's a suboptimal currency area, I think is the kindest thing you can say about it. And I, you know, in that environment, we cannot predict, and I wouldn't try to predict, uh, the financial environment in three to five years or ten years' time. But to say that uh, it would be prudent for the, the Scottish financial services industry to run levels of debt like that, and remember that the British economy is 12 times the size of the Scottish economy, including Scotland, or 11 times if you ex Scotland out. So those numbers get diluted. You know, the British government, I can't remember the number exactly, but Bale put in about 1.2 trillion to save the British banking system. Scotland simply couldn't have done that. It's just not possible. Uh, and I, as I said earlier, I don't much care for QE as a policy, but the Bank of England can do that. A Scottish central bank doesn't have the credibility to do it, because it has no track record. And what would concern people is, I've just listened before, the first time I've been in this building actually, uh, and it was quite an interesting experience. Uh, um, and I, I listened to, I think it was the transport, a little bit of the transport debate beforehand. It was marvellous. There's all sorts of new roads going all sorts of places. And China, 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 China. <laughs> it's wonderful, wonderful things. That's why I'm moving here. <laughs> uh, 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 um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a lack of reality here. You know, it's a just complete lack of reality. There has to be a private sector that generates this underlying uh, wealth. And capital markets will look at the actions of the Scottish Parliament quite closely. And unless they think that it is prepared to take a long view and run a pretty responsible fiscal position, uh, its currency would be very weak if it had an independent currency or its credit rating would be very low. Just on this point about the banking sector that Gavin's just asked about, my um, understanding of, of, of the position is that um, if you look, for example, at Barclays, Barclays in the US did get support from the Fed. Mm. Uh, but there's a difference between liquidity support and recapitalization. Yeah. Now, what would happen is, as I understand it, uh, it uh, associated with a bank in difficulty. Whereas operations in England, the, the Bank of England might, in that case, put in with liquidity support. Mm. Any recapitalization would depend upon the, uh, the, the place where it's done. So. And you're absolutely right, yeah. you, uh, independent Scotland would not have the, the resources no. in a central yeah. bank to, to do the necessary recapitalization. That, that was, you know, that was the, that was the big cost in RBS. It wasn't liquidity support, which is a, a temporary measure from the Bank of England. It was, yeah. it was sums required for yeah. capitalisation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. They, uh, they, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but you're talking about 100 billion or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, which uh, the Scottish GDP is put in context 129 billion, mm -hmm. uh, and I, it's just not really affordable. Yeah. I mean, in terms of security, uh, we all agree this is a dangerous and uncertain world, uh, and terrorism has popped up in very unlikely places in Bali, it's popped up in Madrid, and you know, even in, in Glasgow Airport. Now, I'm not saying that Scotland is at the hub of, of, of terrorist activity, I don't think it is. However, um, Scotland could not hope to manage, match the UK's security uh, um, network, which is actually, despite military cutbacks, world class. Uh, diplomacy, Britain has embassies in almost every country in the world, we're a member of the United Nations Security Council. Um, I, I frankly don't know how you get the people of, of sufficient quality over a, a five-year time horizon to set up embassies in 50 or 60 countries that you might choose to do that. It's, it's going to be a pale shadow of, 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 of British diplomacy. But even if you set up a, a network, you've got to buy buildings, you've got to recruit people, you've got to set up IT systems, you've got to set up um, a new tax system, your driving licenses won't be done from Swansea or wherever they're, they're done from, etc., etc., etc. Now, I'm not going to try and cost that because it's not it's beyond my expertise, but it, it will run into billions of pounds, many billions of pounds. And actually, you'll probably hire the wrong people because you cannot hire that many people overnight with a sufficient quality. And it'll be very inflationary, very inflationary indeed. <laughs>